like we're, we want to make it sound like the original recording, but if, if it's not exact, who's gonna care or no? You know, like so there's kazoos in Halo because I couldn't, I didn't have the effect. I, it's an even time harmonizer. I know what he's using. I just don't have that gear, and I I've been trying to sneak a kazoo into our songs for yeah. several songs up to that point. I'm like. I finally found a place where the zoo fits because it sounds more like the instrument than anything else in my instrument collection. And so dude's like, I approve the kazoo. Because you did reject the kazoo. Wait, did I reject it? There was a, you rejected the kazoo on an earlier song. It may have, I think I tried to raise a little bit of padding your gamer score. I mean, it, and, and you were right to do so. You were like, no, I, I really think the kazoo detracts. And I'm like, but I love kazoo. So I, I just waited for it. I think we did the... On, uh, on Halo, actually, I did do a synth track at one point for the where the kazoo was. It yes. just didn't sound. It wasn't much either. Or reference. Yeah, and that was that was the funny thing is at this point we had this hardcore Halo player, and it was nice to just add some levity to that with kazoo. It was like, yeah. this is so ridiculous. Who would take this game this seriously? Yeah. Except everyone listening. And uh, you know, so I'm like, yeah, let's just do it with kazoos. And then I actually triple tracked the kazoo, three part kazoo harmony. Through three different kazoos. I'm not kidding. Oh, wow. I yeah, one, yeah, two different, wild. two different plastic models and a metal model, which sounds slightly different. The two plastic models sound different anyway, but the metal one is has Tommy Tallarico's logo on it. Uh, absolutely proud of that. Say it all. Yeah, exactly. It's an official Tommy Tallarico gaming music kazoo. The guy that now does video games live and stuff. And he he wrote the music to like Disney's Aladdin on Genesis and Spot Me for Hollywood. You know, dozens of other games, but one year, I, you know, I've, I've known him just casually acquaintance in the industry for years and friends of friends, and he used to walk around E3 with like a gold lime jacket like Elvis, and one year he had uh, like a little person holding a briefcase, and he went around with an entourage, and he was just goofing off. People thought he was serious, though. He was just like, yeah, check me out, I'm the Elvis of game music, and he's just goofing off, but he's like, hey, yeah, hook him up, and so one of his handlers hands me an aluminum business card which I still have. And the other one is like, yeah, you can, uh, you can give him the good stuff. And he gives me a kazoo with his, with his logo imprinted on it. And I'm like, all right, I've got to hold on to this. So I have a, I have a bin of weird instrument harmonicas and, and uh, a jaw harp and you know all kinds of things. And the triangle, the triangle from, from Learn to Spell, I still have that. Uh, slide whistles that I used to use on stage and stuff. So I've just got weird percussive instruments and then I've got the Tommy Tellerico kazoo and I was like, it started shining. You know, I was like, this is why I have you. I got you five years ago. I have no idea. This was your destiny. You will be the Halo kazoo. So um, I was very, very proud. I don't think Tommy. That's right, you don't have the Tommy Tallarico kazoo. It's like, you know, Eric Clapton's got his, his black Stratocaster black E, and then, you know, Eddie Van Halen's got the Frankenstein, I've got the Tommy Tallarico kazoo. <laughs> Hands off. Yeah, like, on a, on a later note to that, I mean, you say that, you, I mean, how do you really choose what type of songs that you want to do for the period? Because I know you picked um, Snow, Hail for Halo, and... That's okay, I remember all the songs. <laughs> Gives you help for learn as well. I mean, how do you like just kind of come up with the ideas for that? Because I know you kind of said that you shop around through the community and what well, there well, and stuff like that. You know, I would say that seventy percent of the time it's because we get a lyric that we think is funny and we just hear it. And uh, the other thirty percent, it's been like, gee, I'd love to cover this song. We both really like that Thomas Dolby song, and we thought it would be a good tour de force. We were in fast times. My rule was let's pick songs that are always going to be popular. We're a dance band, we're an eighties dance band. We want old white people to get up and shake, it, right? So <laughs> Footloose was a song that I fought hard to get into the band. The band, not Jude. You got it. But the other members of the band are like, that's not a good dance song. I'm like, are you high? That song is about dancing in a dance movie with dancing. So, and Kevin Bacon, and you can't do better than that. So, you know, and I said, no, really, if you listen to it, the instrumentation matches our band's strengths. You've got, you know, a, a vocal that I can do, you've got a strong keyboard part, Jude plays guitar. He doesn't stand there behind a the keyboard. He was jumping around with a wireless mini rig and being part of the show. And it had harmonies, and it had like background vocals, and it had bass. I mean, a fantastic bassist. Tim, um, our bassist, works for ILM. Like by day, he was doing the effects, serious effects for like Harry Potter and Transformers and Iron Man and stuff like that. And on the weekends, he's playing with us, doing Duran Duran bass lines and 
unbelievably good player. <laughs> so I fought hard for that, and, and that's kind of carried over to Palace of Ninja. If we have instrumentation fit, if it's something like, I know Jude can nail that, and I know I can nail that, that gives it a little extra. Um, but mostly, it's, it's the song recognizable. I prefer to do up-tempo stuff. Uh, you know, more iconic a song. Gives You Hell was a really big hit at the time. And I just couldn't get away from it. Like, every time I turned on the radio, the song was there. So I was like, Judy, is this kind of airplane in your area? Are you aware of this song? And just learned to spell, I forget where it came from. Just came to me one day. Uh, or came to you or whatever it was. Uh, okay, and I was just like, look, I don't, this is the first mean spirited song we did. It's like, you know, we haven't made fun of anybody, but, oh, I hate it when I see people do stupid stuff on forums, and now it's my job. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I guess it kind of starts with the joke, even though, the, I mean, you know, not all jokes lost in terms of songs. Like, but when we, for Halo, uh, every time I came on the radio, I just thought, Halo, this is all I play. Uh, and then that just sort of suggested, oh, it's a guy who thinks he's really good at the game, but then finds out that he's not, even though he plays it all the time. It sucks. And that was supposed to be like, well, we're all, yeah, you know, nobody's as good as, or as yeah, nobody's as good at, at games as they want to be or think they are. And that was just a real truism. I was like, you know, I play Halo. I get owned every time I go out there. I still play. But the only thing that's missing is I don't tell everybody that I'm good at it. Yeah, no, I know. I haven't been owned by the 10th grade. But the kid, yeah, but the kid that's 10 years old. Yeah, that's my favorite line. You hear his squeaky little that's voice as he's stopping Oh my god! Oh, I totally got you back here! No, no, no. So, it is. Is it worth it? Yeah, exactly. Like, like, don't, don't you have homework? No way. Like, you like the dad and the mom on the other channel. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's family time. Yeah, you're too bad, Nick, son. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah, most of it's... Like the other thing that we really try to do with the songs, um, if it's just a joke, you know, just coming up with a rhyme, isn't it? We always try to tell a story. And this is something that we, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a profound story. But if you look at all of, all of the songs, it's from Viva Pinata on, you know, like Viva Pinata is the story of a guy who's ashamed of playing Viva Pinata, and he finds people to play with, and there's a resolution. There's, there's a linear narrative. One with uh, three red lights, my Xbox is screwed, but even though you could just go and I hate Microsoft for the rest of the song, like, well, then I tried to do this, and I tried to do this, and I tried to go back to the store, and I asked my friends, and, you know, and we were trying to reflect. Uh, you know, hey, look, my, my 360 eventually read me too. Everybody's did, you know, so we realized it was a common thing that everybody could relate to. And, you know, I, I almost, almost cursed with that song. We talked ourselves out of it and wanted to work clean. Originally, when I wrote the, the lyric track, it was I, I should have bought an FNPS3. And we just decided, first of all, we don't want to add the gamer. We're really not into console wars. We're really not into all the negativity that you see on our console. Yeah, we are, we are uh, console agnostic. There's no vibe. <laughs> yeah, like we, you know, and, and our first couple of songs were all about Xbox. And that was because that's where my mind was. You know, like I was at OXM. The first three songs were all about Xbox culture because that's where my mind is. And, you know, that, that caters to it a lot, too. So, um, all of our songs, uh, Halo obviously has a strong story, Arcade Gaming Shrine has a strong story, Arcade Shrine has a strong story, we have a great blue story of Jude Kelly. Uh, <laughs> there's no song in our category, that catalog is more autobiographical than Jude Kelly's Arcade Gaming Shrine. Jimmy is, if you took the J from Jude and the E from Kelly, okay, that's, that's yeah, so that's how we got to Jimmy. Where we got that that's where we got Jimmy. It sounded good, but also it's like, it has to be close enough to Jude Kelly. You say it really fast, Jimmy, just to... Jude Kelly just get the ball. Um, so yeah, we, because just naming, making a list of games, or, or like if you want to do a Call of Duty song and you just want to name all the rifles, that's not fun. Unless you're doing We Didn't Start the Fire. Yeah, Billy Joel, and then you can go M16 and you bring out launchers and rocket launchers, this and launchers, you know. And, and, and it gets tired because then it's just a novelty. I mean, like, I don't think novelty music is bad terms, but you're really aware of the novelty when, ah, it was funny once. And we realized, why do you come back? Why do you even come back? Why do people play games a second? It's a story. It's like a story, because they love the world. So we try to build, in four minutes, a little story with people and characters and situations that are relevant, that you can remember, 
and this matter to you. Everybody's had their stuff. Yeah, the a lot of people know what it's like so to go through a, a red light this thing. One yeah. um, the through red lights. Everybody, everybody has a gamer score thing that they are ashamed of, but they still did anyway. I got the thousand points in Avatar Last Airbender. I, I, I sold right out. And now I wish I had. I really wish I had. But I gotta admit it, I'm, I'm a scorebar, you know? So that, if we can... If we can right, if we can make a commentary about gaming culture, hopefully not a judgmental one, except for learn to spell, which is the really, like, serious thing. Learn the English, please. You're making all of us look bad. Yeah. Um, that's like the public service industry. But other than that, it's about, you know, does the song reflect something greater than us? Is the song interesting to a large amount of people? Is it something that we can pull off? Is, it, is I mean, learn to spell, frankly, now, in, in retrospect, I wish we had taken it down in the beat, because that's just at the top of my range as a singer. I'm not proud of, of that at all. I'm really not proud of that, that vocal performance. And there's a little place where I, I play up the back uh, right before the, the big gang vocal. You can hear my voice crack a little bit. And I did it on purpose because I knew I was going there anyway. So I was like, own it. You know, if I can't get that, right. learn it on yourself. You know, I did that to make it sound a little more desperate because I couldn't. I couldn't nail it, and I was like, Patrick, why don't you just take it down? Pat being my wife, Pat, out to listen to all of this stuff while it's being made. Um, and I'm like, no, I just, you know, it's important that we do it the way it is on the record. And if we can sing it in that key, I can sing it in that key. And that's not always the case. <laughs> but I think that it would have sounded really bad. You had already recorded all your parts at that point. I, I, vocals generally come in last. You know, lyrics come first, vocals come last. But that's the way that you make records. It's, it's, it's how it makes them and stuff. Who's charging um, $4 for sandwiches? And sure enough, uh, you know, that that's just what it was. It was too late. I knew that it would, it would affect the tonality and the recording. It would sound something's a little off. And it would be because nothing was in its original key and its sound. It would all sound dark. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've transposed anything. We should, Charlie. We should. Yeah. <laughs> some of which we have trouble finding out. Yeah, some songs will try will start to do them and we'll figure out that it's like halfway between the key that Dan's doing it in and the key that I'm doing it in. I realize that they actually do it in a half step. Yeah, they do it in a half step or like, you know, they tune to a pitch that matches the guy's voice yeah. and then they'll retune all the other instruments to do that. And you know, we don't find that out until we start doing it. Um, well, like on a related note, have you guys ever thought of like actually writing your own songs or stuff like this? Or is that yes, we have. I I have one or two ideas that might work, but I haven't really brought them to June because again, like now you're getting even more work. Like if, if making music <laughs> is fun. You know, we're, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as the saying goes. You know, we don't have to do the heavy lifting on writing a song and actually finding things that don't sound like another song. We just find a song that sounds just like itself and recover that. You know, that's great, yeah. Um, you know, we both, I think we, when we talk about our influences, Weird Al, obviously, is the biggest. I the guy who does parodies better than anybody has ever done in the history of man. And we both love not only his main parodies, where he's doing a specific song by a specific band, but there's also all the original songs. Starting at a it's kind of like thrown in on the album, and you listen to it, and you're like, well, that goes all the way out. Because it isn't a parody. It's usually thrown the style of another band. Right. Like, him playing Dog Eat Dog. Yeah, perfect police song. It's a police song that the police never wrote, and we'll never sing about it. They'll do it against you. It's essentially a Devo song. It's a love song. And Devo, they were mad that he wrote it and the video right there. Yeah, you know, so, so, so you know, we, we were like, his originals are legitimate and funny, and he puts the same amount of effort in. And, you know, people just don't, they only want to hear the Nirvana song, and they only want to hear it. And, and Jude and I are more into the deep cuts. Yeah, like, we're listening to all of them now. And so we know that to do original songs and, and be funny at it, you still have to put just as much effort 